Okay, so boxes and devices is the topic for today's lesson. Right off the bat, let's see what the first picture is. Bang, all right, what do we see here? It looks like it's a device box. Do we see any devices in it? If you can consider the wire connector as a device, then yeah, maybe you can uh, treat it as a device. Uh, this is a, an excellent job done by a qualified electrician somewhere. Um, and um, it's a really good recipe for getting fired or uh, starting a fire, or <laughs> not getting the next job. Uh, let's see what is correct about this one. Well, there's nothing that is correct about this box. And as we go along, we're going to pick those things uh, and uh, uh, after the, this, this lesson and the next, you should be able to tell yourself what is going on here and why this thing is wrong. Just, you know, aside from um, that this, is, this looks like a you know, kind of a spaghetti thing. All right, so just so things like that don't happen, um, well, there are different electrical codes wherever you go, and pretty much they would say similar things, but we're talking about the Canadian electrical code because that's where we are. So um, let's just analyze some of the um, uh, content that we have to analyze here. The CEC, so Canadian Electrical Code, determines the amount of wires in an electrical box can hold. So, the color, it, how many wires you can fit in the box actually is determined by the CEC, which is Canadian Electrical Code, and based on the following things. Oh. The total volume of the box, and well, here's... <laughs> Uh, here is um, something that you're going to notice. Sometimes, well, because we're in Canada, um, we switched to the metric system some years ago, many years ago, but uh, we still have the imperial system embedded in our whatever branch of the industry pretty much everywhere. So quite often you're going to see the mix of the two, the imperial and the um, metric system. All right, so how many wires can you fit in the box? And this is that depends on how big the box is, All right? So, but we want to sound smart. So we will say, you know, it depends how big the box is. Well, let's say that the total volume of the box, and we're going to specify the volume in milliliters. And sometimes you're going to see also the equivalent uh, number for the uh, cubed inches. Uh, <clears throat> all right so first thing how big the box is makes sense right the bigger the box the more you can fit in it yeah. easy right uh the size of the wires well how big are the wires that we can fit in that specific device box um, so that also makes a difference that makes sense the bigger the wires the, the less of them you can fit in the specific box. And the smaller the wires, the more you can fit, uh, fit in there. Okay, so uh, there you go. That's what you're paying for. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, the type and the size of the device mounted to the box. So depending on if it's just a switch or is it GFCI, what's GFCI? GFCI is a uh, device, well, it, Usually it, it, it would be a, a duplex receptacle that is uh, equipped with the ground fault circuit interrupt circuitry. What does it mean? It means that, uh, well, when the current flows from the hat to not, and through the load, so okay. So the current starts flowing from the hat wire gets to the load, from the load, returns to the electrical panel through the neutral wire. And there's only one pathway. So whatever leaves, goes through the load and it comes back on the neutral, whatever leaves comes back. There is no any other way for the current to flow. 
So the current flowing out has to be equal to the current flowing in. And that's what the GFCI circuitry measures. If there is any deviation from that, then that means that some of the current did not make it back to the neutral, which means that some of the current escaped to the ground through, well, usually it would be through the device box. Uh, maybe some water got in it and the water is conductive, so some of the current flows through the water and goes into the ground through the device box that is grounded. Um, notice that this is ground fault circuit interrupt. So that would be the ground fault, right? Right. So that means the current that's flowing out is supplying the load and is supplying the current also that is flowing out of there wherever it goes to the ground. And whatever comes back would be this current that's flowing in minus the current that escapes through the device box to the ground. So those currents will be different. And if there's a difference between those two currents, the GFCI says, oh, there is a ground fault somewhere because some of the current escapes to the ground. And um, that means something is wrong so that the GFCI goes pop and it just opens the circuit. And you can install those at the electrical panel or you can install those at the location of the device. <clears throat> As we go along, you will see what this one looks like. It's the duplex receptacle with kind of a button when it says test and one says reset. And usually you got it. Maybe uh, um, we would have to install them by the kitchen sink. No, because there's water there in close proximity. Maybe by the bathroom sink, wherever there's water. Outside, it could rain. There you go. So, uh, all right, but because of the GFCI circuitry takes some space, the duplex receptacle looks a little bit bulkier on the inside. So it needs a little bit more space to fit in the device box. So if that thing is bigger, then you can also, you're filling up some of the volume, which means there's less wires you can put in there, right? So that's just, so let's just read this again. Uh, how many wires can you fit in a box? Well, it depends on the size of the box and it depends on the size of the wires and it depends on the size of the devices mounted to the box. If it's a, just a switch, regular switch, like a, a single pole switch, then it's a relatively small device. So that means it leaves you more space for running the wires inside the box. But if it's a GFCI, it's a bulkier device. And of course it takes up some space so you can't fit so many wires as if you did, if there was less space left by the device. Got it, got it, okay. And the number of wire connectors, well, these are the wire connectors that are used inside the box. All right, so we just successfully, congratulations, we successfully made it, excuse me, through the first slide. Let's go, keep going. All right, here's a table 23. All right, number of conductors in the boxes. And that would be, uh, you know, I would encourage you to find that in the book that you purchased for the great amount of money. And uh, that is going to be your window to success, as Dr. Neck says. Uh, <clears throat> so find that table there. Right. Number of conductors in the boxes. Well, what do we have here? First column here is box dimension size. And there's the type of box. And then there's next, we move on to the next column and it tells you what volume that box occupies or has to offer. And then there is uh, the next column and there are different gauges of the wires, American wiring gauge. So gauge 14 which is, well, the one that we were playing with during our labs, uh, then gauge 14, sorry, gauge 12 would be, see, the smaller number of the gauge, the thicker the wire. So here's certain type of a wire, then gauge 12 would be thicker wire, then gauge 10 would be even thicker, and you get the idea, right? So the thicker the wire, you, less of them you can fit. So let's analyze some of that octagonal or octagonal, octagonal box. Four inches by 
one and a half. So you only have to specify one side on the octagonal box. And um, then you specify the depth. The last number is always the depth. All right. So when you only have to specify one side, you're only going to see one number. But if you have to specify two sides, like for example, three by two, then you have to specify two sides. And the third number is the depth of the box. So let's take a look at, uh, let's say, where we have to specify a oh, uh, square box, for example. A square is a square. Right? All sides are equal. So you only have to specify one side. So square box, four inches by one and a half, or four inches by, um, uh, let's say, two and one eighth of an inch. OK. So four inches by one and a half, for example. So it's a four inches. So four inch by four inch and one and a half inches deep. It occupies the volume of 344 milliliters and milliliter, one milliliter, of course, is one thousandth of a liter. Uh, what's the size of the Coca-Cola box? or not box, but bottle, the big, co big Coca-Cola bottle or pop bottle, ginger ale or something like that. It's more than a liter. I think it's a two liter, right? So you get the idea. Uh, so 245, uh, sorry, uh, square box, four by inch and a half. It occupies or it has, to sp it has the space or it has the volume of uh, 344 milliliters or 21 cubed inches. All right. all right, so let's move on here. If we have if we have 14 in 14 gauge conductors, we can fit 14 of them in there and be legal. Right? If you want 15, then you're illegal. Right? And you go to jail. It's a half joke because with some of the if you do some of the wrong installations, you could actually be criminally responsible for that. If because uh, electricity is no joke. <coughs> Anyways, if it's twelve gauge, you can fit twelve of them. If it's ten gauge, which is thicker, so you can fit less. You can fit only nine. If it's eight gauge, you can fit only seven of them. And if it's six gauge, which is quite thick, you can only fit four wires in that box. Let's take a look at the three by three, three by two. And this is interesting uh, box here because three by two, two inches. So it looks like, like that. Remind you of something? What about the box that we used to play with in the lab, during the labs? It's a three by two, the utility box. It's a standard size. It's also called one or single gang box. One, because though you can gang those boxes. So here's a single gang box. If you add another one beside it and make a, one bigger box out of it, that would be a double gang box. So that would be four inches across, like that, four inches by three. Right? You can go triple gang, quadruple gang, and so on. See, sometimes you have those multiple light switches on one kind of a gang of a switches. Well, that's 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 the sizing of the boxes that we're talking about, right? So three by two, and the three is the one that goes down here, right? <coughs> Excuse me, All right? Okay. Uh, so three by two by inch and a half, it takes 131 milliliters or eight cubic inches, and you can fit five of 14 of gauge 14 wires in it you can fit four gauge 12 wires and you get the idea now here this uh, is a deeper box same box but it's a deeper instead of one and a half inch deep this will be three by two single gang box two inches deep well of course it's going to have more volume and look you can fit more wires you can fit six instead of five or 14 gauge and so on. 
but usually when uh, when you get the deeper boxes you want to get them for sure if you get the gfci uh, gfci uh, let's say duplex receptacle huh? because it takes more space you need to have some space so it can run the wires as well all right and um, um, you can just analyze this table here because it's basically used the, the same way of analyzing this table. Now, say table 22. Uh, so 23, table 22. Space for conductors in the boxes. So this one tells you how much each conductor uses, how much space each conductor uses. All right, so size of the conductors in gauge. 14 gauge wire in the box uses it requires 24 milliliters gauge 12 is a thicker wire of course uses more milliliters requires to be freely situated there and so on gauge 10 36.9 and so on you get the idea here right okay so that's that's how you read these kind of this information here. Now, when I say that uh, you can fit only so many wires in the box, but there could be someone who is going to start arguing about, well, yeah, but this is not considered a wire. This is a con this is wire. This is so on. Yeah, there could be some argument. So um, some people get together and they were very smart ones and they kind of like either witnessed some of the arguments or predicted that some could someone could be um, having those arguments so they made it clear what is a conductor and how do we count the conductors not going to go through the whole thing but i'm going to get you to start thinking this way and i'm pretty sure a lot of us uh if not all uh already got the vibe of the language that is being used in the electrical code it's almost like studying law it's almost like studying to be a lawyer not quite but you know from that direction all right <clears throat> so maximum number of conductors in a box all right let's kind of analyze some of the content here boxes shall be of sufficient size to provide usable space for all insulated conductors contained in the box let's say again boxes shall be of sufficient size in order to provide usable space for conductors so basically if you put conductors in the box the box has to be big enough to fit them basically that's what it says subject to following and you can substitute that with just one word but there's always a but so with these conditions and here are the conditions of what is considered to be a conductor and how do we count the conductors from left to right not just kidding uh, all right so let's see subject to the following so here are the conditions condition a a conductor running through a box with no connection so here's a conductor that enters the box and leaves the box and it's not connected to anything it just goes through the box and here's the big language here therein shall be considered as one conductor so basically what this one says if there's a wire that runs through the box and doesn't connect to anything just goes through the box goes in and out it's considered as one wire one conductor <clears throat> Let's see condition B. Each conductor entering or leaving a box, and if it's connected to a terminal or a connector within the box, shall be considered as one. Which means if there's a wire that enters the box and it's connected to something, we count it as one conductor. 
Well, okay. Let's see condition C. A conductor of which? A conductor of which no part leaves the box shall not be counted pretty much. So let's just, uh, here, let's just take a look at this here. A conductor of which no part leaves the box shall not be counted. So we just pretend we don't see it. We don't count that. So it could be a conductor from one connector to another or whatever. Right? There's a conductor in the box and it doesn't leave the box. It's contained within the box. Got it? Got it. And here's another condition here, condition D. Number uh, gauge 18 and 16 wires, those are fixture wires um, supplying a luminaire mounted on the box. So there's a box, electrical box, and there is a light fixture. Basically, it's a light fixture, what's called a luminaire, right? And the light fixture, it has all the whatever lights coming out. And there's some wires internally. And then there's some, some wires that are coming out of that, all those connections, and coming out of some sort of like a whatever exit from that fixture. Those wires are not counted. Let's see here, number 18. So usually there will be 18 or 16 gauges, uh, gauge wires, those. Uh, you know, not my favorite ones to connect uh, because usually there will be stranded wires and you have a solid wire and if you have this uh, twist on connector, they do not behave the way you want uh, because you're combining a solid wire with a stranded wire and usually you have to be very careful. You will end up with a wrap around, which is not the happiest case. But I say, okay, let's, let's read this whole thing again. Number 18 and 16 gauge fixture wires. Um, I'll get to that question. Number 18 and 16 gauge fixtures supplying wires, luminaire, they are not counted. Right. And there's a question. Uh, why would someone run a conductor through a box with no connection? Okay, well, um, sometimes on the, uh, when you're running a project on the construction side, you would run uh, some wires that go from one place to another and they go through some junction box. And that junction box can supply the raceway or way for the wires. Maybe some other wires meet there and some other wires are going to be interrupted, connected to something else. And some will just pass through that box. So you're going to have uh, different situations. Uh, so just so you don't have to run another uh, pipe or conduit because you can use the same one so you can run a wire through a box it's a common practice yeah so um, why would somebody write? yeah so that's uh yeah you will see some of those yeah. they're trying to they're trying to predict any kind of situation that uh, um, that can happen okay? all right so we're not going to go through the whole thing this here you will be learning in uh, the courses that teach you the code. This is not a code class, so we're going to stop right here. But we had to talk about the boxes and devices, and we had to talk about the wires that are there. Right. So keep reading on that here, and uh, you will, uh, you know, uh, it's a little bit of a brain twister. But once you get into the groove of understanding the language that is, that is being used, uh, with the electrical code, then after a while, it, uh, it it's going to just fall in place as you read that stuff. Okay. Now, let's take a look at some of the boxes. A single gang, yeah, is that the next slide? Yes, it is. A single gang, remember they are talking about the gang? Okay, so how do we count the gangs? Single gang, and if you put another box beside it, it will be a double gang. If you put another box beside it, it will be another triple gang, quadruple gang, and so on. So let's say, let's take a look at a single gang box. The utility box that we are using in lab two and uh, probably the last lab as well. <clears throat> uh, these are the single gang boxes, right? the utility box, two by three or three by two. Single gang device box. So three by two by two and a half inches. 
So it's three by two, two and a half inches deep. And you can fit eight number 14 gauge conductors in there and be legal. Single gang device box, most common sizes and uses. For example, when you have three by two by two and a half inches, or you can have three by two deeper, three inches deep. So the not as deep box, uh, you can use it for duplex receptacles and switches and well, just one more, you know, one common type of a bread and butter type of a box. Now when you have GFCI, the GFCI, uh, remember it's a ground fault circuit interrupt. It has a circuitry that has to do some calculations and comparing things, currents in there. So it needs a little bit of space. So it's a duplex receptacle. The one, remember, when you see by the bathrooms uh, sinks or the kitchen sinks and, uh, and, and anywhere there's water uh, or outside, uh, you're going to see those duplex receptacles with the, um, what do you call it? The couple of buttons. One is just reset and one is um, test. Right? So these are the GFCI. <coughs> we'll go a little bit more detail. Well, actually, I, we just did um, a couple of minutes ago. All right. So for those, because they are bigger, you know, you should use the three inches deeper boxes. Front face of the box. Okay, so it says front face. It's another another piece of information. Front. It applies to the box, but it's unrelated to this. Uh, front face of the box extends half inch in front of the stud for drywall. What does that mean? Well, is there a next slide here? Yeah, there we go. You see those two boxes? They are not flashed. So here is the stud for timber framing. You could also have um, steel studs as well. But there are those, um, those kind of uh, outlets or outputs there, the reach outs, guides. You put that against that stud and the box is going to stick out half inch forward. The reason for that is, is that when the drywall covers this timber framing, the drywall's thickness is half inch. And when you put the, when you add the half inch thickness of the drywall on top of the studding, then you're going to have a nice flash situation that the surface of the box is going to be nice flash equal uh, with the drywall. Well, there you go. So that's why that's what it says here. It's just additional information. Front face of the box extends half inch. And there are guides for, uh, for that. All right. So single gang boxes with devices terminated. That's the title of this slide here. Well, here you have, you can see, here's a single pole switch. Where is that? Uh, no, it doesn't say anything. So here's a, uh, no, that's not a single pole. Here's a three-way switch. How can you tell it's a three-way switch? Well, how many ways to get into the switch? A one, a two, a three, a, uh, a. Uh. Okay, so that is the three-way switch. We'll study those. And here, look at this, look at this here. It's a four-way switch. How can you tell? Oh, a one, a two, a three, a four. Okay, so there you go. Uh, so <clears throat> there are four terminals on this switch. So it's called a four-way switch. And look, this one is bigger and this one is smaller. So there are specifications on that switch and what kind of volume it takes. And based on that, you have to make way for some of the wires or you know, take away some of the wires. So with the same size of the box, you can fit less wires when you're using this four-way switch than if you use that one there. And you have to look at the box that it says, uh, whatever the volume is. And according to electrical code, which you're going to study in more depth, uh, you're going to be able to tell how many wires you are legal to fit with this device in it or with this device in the same box. I just, I'm raising your awareness to this. All right, single gang, 
single gang device box, cover plates, or face plates. Here is a face plate or cover plate for a duplex receptacle. And here is a face plate or a face cover for a switch. Yeah, simple, eh? There you go. All right. Now we're getting to some meat and potatoes fun. All right, two gang device box, double gang box. Now, you see, we, we still have the three inches because that's it here. This doesn't change. When you when you when you when you gang those boxes, you go sideways. So instead of two inches, you're going to have two inches times two. And what's two times two? If you get your calculator and punch that in, I bet you're gonna get four. Uh, so um, two by three by four, and this one let's say this one is two and a half inches deep, and this one here can fit 16 of 14 gauge conductors. All right. All right, now here's a square box, four inch square box. So this one is uh, specified as four by inch and a half. So you only get the one side because it's a square. So all sides are equal. So you only have to say specify the size or length of one side four by one and a half so of course it says it's one and a half inches deep that can fit 14 of number 14 gauge conductors and what's the knot here not often used in residential wiring but it can be if you want to make a junction box yes you can use that box exception cable connections with no devices, which would be something like, uh, you know, cable connections with no, well, no devices. So based on the information that I just gave you so far, you can pretty much tell right now that this box is overfilled. There's no way this box is legal, yeah. but there's no devices. Bunch of wires get in and bunch of wires get out. There are different connections. So it's, it serves as a junction box. And look, it's a, it's a square box. Look at that. It's a square box. Four, four inches, but uh, four by inch and a half. Okay, let's go here. All right, so cable connections with, okay. So not often used in the residential area, but it can be exception cable connections with no devices. All right, four inch square box used in a connection point for a circuit. Well, here you can tell there are some wires going in and there's a four inch and this one looks like it has, it's extended. So it's extra deep um, and there are wires. There are no devices. There are just wires connecting whatever the connections have to be made in order to make proper connections for whatever the situation is here and you make the connections there cover this thing with the with the blank plate and that's it you're done all right now let's take a look at the triple gang triple gang device box three by six of course this three doesn't change it's a triple so two 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 three times two Oh, it's six. And this one is two and a half inches deep. And that one can accommodate 24. How many? 24 of 14 gauge conductors. The more volume you get, the more you can fit in it. And how are those gangable boxes work? <coughs> Excuse me. You can buy the gangable boxes. Is that the next slide? Well, let's let's get to uh, to it when we get to it. All right. So that was a triple gang, and that was this one is a four gang. Uh, before we before we finish, uh, we're we're going to go right up to twenty five. No, just kidding. Uh, so 
four gang device box, three by eight by two inch and a half. So how do we read it? Three, this doesn't change, this height of the box. And of course, four gang, two inches, it takes for one gang, oh, I can't do that. One gang takes two inches always. So two and a two and a two and a two, four times two, eight. If you don't believe me, punch it in the calculator, four times two. And it's two and a half inches deep. And this one can fit 32. How many? 32 14, eight, 14 gauge conductors. There you go. So these are the gang about boxes. Some boxes you can buy. I think I said the next slide. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Also, what you can have is plastic for gang device boxes. Where would you use that? Well, this is, would be a common practice to use behind like the flat screen TV or something like that. So it doesn't stick out from the wall because the connector's there. So it's like a recessed box. And quite often they, uh, they accommodate more than just electrical connection. So behind that wall, in that wall, there, uh, there, there, there would be electrical wires run, uh, like service conductors, which were supplying the power, and there could be some signal wires. Uh, what, what can we see here? We can see some telephone wire there. We can see some coaxial cable. We can see some speaker cables, and we can see some signal cables. So a bunch of things, uh, nice in one place, beautiful, aesthetically made. And uh, because it's recessed, so those connectors do not stick out from the wall. So you have more space to, to, um, to mount, let's say, flat screen TV or something like that, all right? And some of them look like this. And some of them look like this. I guess that was the point of these two slides, <laughs> all right? All right, here we go. I always wanted to, to, to mention that. Here are those gangable boxes. These boxes are a good idea to have in your stash, in your working van, or whatever you take with you, because if you're in a pinch and you have to use more than single gang box, because you're installing something, and if you're planning the installation and you are supposed to, you know you're going to use four gang box or quadruple gang box or, uh, you know, triple gang box. You just go and when you do the ordering, you order that so you don't have to waste time putting it together. You just go and get it, install it, and you're done. But if you're in a pinch that you're kind of surprised, oh, I thought that we didn't have to install it, but it turns out that we do have to install it, you know, that kind of situation. Um, uh, so um, you can get those gangable boxes, and instead of wasting time or losing time, on ordering, waiting for the order, or going somewhere, you can still finish the job the same way. You just put them like Lego blocks. Remember those Lego things? Now you know why they made it so much fun for you to play with the Lego blocks. It's not so you could have fun, but it's so they could make a worker out of you. Well, you know what? If uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a good thing because if you know how to do stuff, then you are more employable, and then you know, it's easier for you to support yourself and your family. Okay, so that's a good thing. I was just kind of using my sense of humor. You're gonna get used to it. Uh, all right. So those, if you take this side out. And if you take this side out, because they are removable, and put those boxes together, they fit and they screw in and they kind of uh, go nicely together. And you can have something like this. Look at that. Isn't that cool? All right. And now all of a sudden you have a double gang box out of two single gang boxes. Not all the boxes are gangable, but if you want to have that, you always have that option. Right. So that's one good thing to have in your stash, those gangable boxes. Also a good idea to have when it comes to mounting things. When you are mounting a box, let's see here, let's go back a few slides. 
there you go. If it's a new installation, and that's before the drywall is installed, or maybe sometimes there is no drywall at all, and you have the um, exposed rib cage of all the framing, no problem, you're laughing, you just mount them to the studs. But if everything is covered and you're making like addition and you don't want to destroy, um, and if you want to just if you don't want to destroy the already installed drywall i saw the question i'll be right there uh, then you're going to have to use some sort of device that will help you to do that so you don't have to mount it to the stud and here is something that's called a f clip or f straps because it looks like a letter f okay uh, so with this one you can slide that in from one side, slide that in from bend that little. Look at some of the YouTube videos. We are at the age of um, you know, information available to you know at our tips, uh, fingertips, because you just punch it in the keyboard and you get the information. Look at how to install it. It's ridiculously easy and funnily ridiculously easy on how to use that. Uh, and uh, and those are cheap, so you can just have a box of them, um, and you can you can have it uh, in your van, right? All right. Uh, here's a question: How would you attach the gangable box? Okay. Um, in order to attach the gangable box, you could you could screw it in to the stud, or you could use the F clips depending on what the situation is. So take a, just, um, when you go to YouTube, punch in, in the search, F clips installation, uh, electrical, or something like that. Electrical installation, F clips, or F straps. And uh, you, this thing's going to light up with a whole bunch of um, people, you know, one smarter than the other, telling you how to do this. Right? <clears throat> So they are, you know, they, 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 they can just to answer a question. They can accommodate uh, installation right on the stud. Where is that? Uh, you can install it right on the stud, and uh, you can also install them onto the steel studs. And sometimes you might might want to get different attachments, but usually you can just go and install uh, them on the steel studs. Uh, so screw them from the sideways, and you can use this these F clips, but I'll leave it with you. Uh, please, please, please do yourself a favor and look at those F clips on YouTube, how to install them. They're beautiful. You don't have to have a stud. You can just mount it right on the drywall. OK, common devices used in gang boxes. Well, what do we have here? A single pole switch which is also technically can be called a two-way switch because there's this wire coming in and coming out and it's just interrupting or closing the connection here. So single pole switch. Oh, it says single pole switch. Or a duplex receptacle. It's what we've been playing with already in the labs. Now let's take a look at the duplex receptacles. A duplex, a duplex receptacle has three brass side tab removed uh, tab oh okay hold on let me read it again okay a duplex receptacle has the brass side tab removed in order to make a split receptacle most common uses countertop receptacle in the kitchen and a split receptacle in the living spaces Let's take a look at this. Over here, we have the duplex receptacle, just like the one that we've been playing so far with. And it has two prongs. One is the shorter prong, one is the longer prong. Remember, the shorter prong is the hot one, and the longer prong is the neutral. How do, how, what would be the easy way to remember? Hot is a shorter word. 
than neutral. Neutral is a longer word, needs more space to write it, more, it has more letters in it. And hot is just H-O-T. So it's a short word, hot. So it's a short prong. Neutral is a longer word. So this will be the black wire, hot, if it's just a 14-2, 14, two, 14 uh, yeah, 14-2. And this will be the white wire as a neutral. So here is one receptacle here. And here's another receptacle here. So there are two receptacles in this receptacle. <laughs> so it's a duplex receptacle because it's the two. So this short prong is directly connected to this screw terminal right here. This one here is directly connected to this screw terminal right here. And same thing on the other side. But there's a tab right here, which you can remove very easily with just needle nose pliers. And once you remove that tab, you're disconnecting these two. So once you disconnected these two, and it's done on the hot side, because you can still use the neutral to come back to the. Uh, Uh, electrical panel. Right? You can remove those two. They can have completely two independent right um, receptacles in there. But if you split the hot, neutral goes to the neutral bar on the uh, electrical panel. So that's fine. And right now you can have 14.3, for example, or I would suggest maybe 12.3 because then you are raising the opacity of the cable and notice that the, 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 the white one out of these three wires, if there was white, black, and red, so black and red will be the hot wires and white is always neutral. The white one will be the busiest one of them all because if this circuit is being used, the white one takes, provides a return path for the current. If this one is not used, maybe this one is used, then the white one again provides the return path for this one. And if both of them are used, then the white one still provides the return path for the current for both of them. So the white one, the neutral, will be the busiest one out of them all. So if you're upping the um, opacity of the whole system here, you might want to consider uh, the proper gauge of the whole conductor, of the whole wiring. Well, that's another topic for another day. Point is that you can make two circuits out of there. So there could be a neutral cable, go, neutral conductor going here with the white, and there will be a black here, for example, going to a its own circuit breaker in the electrical panel. And there will be the red one that also goes to a separate and its own circuit breaker in the electrical panel. So you have two circuits there. So that's why called a split receptacle. Why would we want to install it in the kitchen countertop? Well, just imagine a regular household, family getting up, uh, kids going to school, parents going to work. So the kitchen is busy. So uh, you have, what do you have? The kind of like a, somebody wants to make a shake. So the blender is going, the toaster is going, the tea kettle is going, the coffee maker is going. So some, sometimes at some point you can actually overload the circuitry. So that's why to provide extra opacity and opacity is the ability to carry current. Um, <clears throat> so there'll be more ability to carry current in the system if you add, if you split the receptacles, right? That's why we split them and that's how we split them, and that's what it looks like right here. There you go. Here's a neutral, and here's the broken off tab, and here's black wire, hot, and here's a red wire, hot. What is wrong with this one? What is wrong with this picture? Ooh, can somebody see it? Jacketing. Thank you, Olivia. What about the jacketing? You're in a touching. The jacketing is pinched. 
So it's touching the screw terminal, not only touching, it's actually pinched by the screw terminal. So the screw terminal is making contact with the jacketing and not as much contact as we want to possibly with the rest of the connector. Squished, there we go. That's another good thing, okay. All right. Uh, footprints of the devices. Right. Devices used in the gang boxes. Look at this. This is just the regular, the one that we use. And this is GFCI. See, this is test and reset. And it's a bigger, bulkier, deeper device. But it's rated for 15 amps. And this one here is rated for 20 amps. It's also GFCI. But it doesn't matter. The footprint, it doesn't matter if it's a GFCI. The footprint suggests that this is rated for 20 amps. Let's say the window air conditioner unit, uh, it's going to require 20 amps. And remember, in electricity, the load does not ask for the current. It just goes and takes it. And if there is not enough that the, the panel can supply, it will still try to take it. Right. So, but it might not. So you're going to have a syst faulty system. So mm, the, the plug from the window air conditioner that is used for 20 amps, which means it's at all costs, is going to 20 amps, all mine, all mine, give it to me. I'm taking it. Well, <clears throat> If it was, if this were plugged in into the 15th amp circuit, it would overload that. So in order to prevent that, you were going to have a diff different footprint on the plug of the air conditioner unit. So you can't plug it in to this, but you can plug it in to a 20 amp circuit. Can you plug in a regular thing that is going to take three amps? Yes. You can plug it in here because all it's going to take is going to take three amps if that's what it needs. The load takes what it takes. So you can plug in. It's, it's it be, just because it's it's a 20 amp circuit, mean, that means it is able to provide 20 amps if the load is going to try to take it. But it's not pushing 20 amps onto everything. It's capable of supplying 20 amps. That's what the that's what I'm saying here. Right. So footprints. Just take a look at the at the footprints and analyze it somehow. I'll, you know, some of that thing will be on the test. Twenty amps, fifteen amps, and whatnot. I might ask you some of the questions on that. And then before we leave, we're almost done, guys. We're going a little bit longer. Uh, I will leave you with this here. And we already talked about it uh, in the morning, but let's talk about it again. It is important. That's why I just please stay with that with me right now. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the point. Let's say that you have this 15 amp circuit installed not too far from the window and you want to install the window air conditioner and it has this plug, so you can't plug it into this. So what do you have to do? You're going to have to replace this receptacle with the one that is rated for 20 amp right right and what else do you have to do well you have to go on the other side and you have to replace the circuit breaker that is not going to trip or disconnect when more than 15 amps are being taken because now we want 20 amps so we're going to have to replace that circuit breaker with the 20 amp circuit breaker and we are done right and I'm waiting for your response. Is that what we have to do? Is that all that we have to do? We have yes. Thank you for speaking out and thank you for being brave. If I had a candy, I would give it to you, but I don't. But it's actually no. What else do we have to replace? We have to make sure that the cable that connects the circuit breaker into the device is also capable of carrying the 20 amps. American wiring gauge, yes, there we go. 
So what is rated for 20 amps? Well, gauge 12 is rated for 20 amps. So we have to replace the cable as well. If you just replace this, so the receptacle, and you replace the circuit breaker, you are putting yourself in danger of actually starting a fire because that thing is going to work extra hard and it's not rated for it, which means it might get warm. No. And if it gets warm, it might get warmer and it might get hotter and it actually can't start a fire. You know, it's uh, yes and no, yes. Uh, well, because usually the cables are uh, capable of carrying more than they are rated for. But if you use 14 gauge wire and in the, and you're trying to push 20 amps through it, then you are illegal. And that means that if something happens and somebody finds out that you were the one who installed that and house burns down, burns down, God forbid somebody dies, then you could be in a quite a bit trouble, right? So that's why, you know, it's a serious thing. Um, you know, um, electricity is a serious thing. You need, a, you need a license to operate a gun in our country, okay? And because if you don't know what you're doing, you or somebody else might get hurt. Well, you also need a license to install electricity because if you don't know what you're doing, you can also um, hurt yourself or somebody else. And there are different levels of licenses on based on the severity of the job that is involved. Okay, so two o'clock. I'm sorry, I just had a couple minutes longer. I was supposed to let you out at 10 minutes to the hour on the clock. But I thought it would be important to uh, to mention. All right, and that would be the last slide of this here. And if there are no any questions, I will, I will stay maybe a couple seconds or 15 seconds. If somebody has a question to ask, shoot. But if don't, uh, just send me an email. Um, okay, that's it. Hey, you know what? It's Friday. Have a wonderful and safe and pleasant weekend. Thank you very much and have a good one, guys. I always keep... I have to find those buttons here. There you go. Stop sharing. <laughs> Bye, guys.